did you ever have an uh-oh moment when you woke up in the morning and discovered you'd no voice, or very little voice? Well, that was my experience this morning. Um, but we trust that the Lord will give help and assistance as, as we come to consider his word together. We're going to look at Psalm 45, as I indicated a couple of weeks ago, we are going to spend our mornings, the, the mornings that I am preaching, we're going to spend those looking at uh, Hebrews, and then in the evenings, as the Lord uh, gives us help, we're going to look at some of the Psalms that are contained and at the start, at the commencement of, he of the book, the letter to the Hebrews. And this morning, this evening, we're going to consider Psalm 45 together. And as you see, I've given this uh, sermon this evening the title, A King Worth Loving. A King Worth Loving. Do you know what an earworm is? I'm not sure if any of you have ever experienced an earworm. Now, it's not a parasitic infection that you get in your ear. No, it's, it's the experience of hearing a song or maybe just a few words of a song with the result that that particular song plays on a loop in your mind for hours on end and perhaps even for days. And it can become very, very annoying. Well, I'm going to give you an earworm. Do the words, what's love got to do with it? Does the, do those words ring any bells? For some of you, you won't have a clue. You'll have never heard that before. And for others of you, Tina Turner is blasting off in your mental eardrums right now. Why have I seen it fit to give you an earworm? Well, the title of this psalm tells us that it is a love song. The superscription at the beginning of the psalm is, To the choir master, according to Lilies, a masquil of the sons of Korah, a love song. But, it, but this psalm bears little resemblance to the so-called love songs that are the order of our day. And at first glance, we might ask of this psalm, what's love got to do with it? Well, before we break into the psalm, let's look at a few things to see if we can answer that question before we, before we begin. This psalm is described in the title as a maskil, a maskil. That's a Hebrew word, and it's just, it's not translated, it's just transliterated. But that word comes from another Hebrew word that means to instruct or to be skillful. To call this psalm a maskil could be a way of saying that this is a psalm to instruct or to impart wisdom or insight. Or on the other hand, on the other hand maskil could be a way of saying that this psalm was skillfully composed. We're not sure. We're not sure which way to take this word, but it doesn't really matter because both ways are presented in this psalm. It is a very artistic, skillfully composed piece of poetry. It is so artistically and skillfully laid out, but it also imparts wisdom and it also imparts insight to all those who read it, especially though to the bride in the psalm. <clears throat> she is told to understand. She is instructed to understand. She is exhorted to take in the full implications of her status as the wife of the king. Another question is who is the psalmist? Again, we're not entirely sure. As you can see from the superscription, the title of the psalm, it's a maskil of the sons of Korah. Now, in the Hebrew, the word translated, the, the word that is translated of could also be translated by or for so it could be it could mean that this psalm was written by the sons of Korah or it could mean it was written for the sons of Korah we're not sure um, who's the king again we're not given a name we're not told that this was Solomon we're not told that it was Hezekiah we're not told that the king is Joash or any other king in David's line and yet, 
There is a difficulty in seeing any of David's sons as being the one described here because there's such lofty language and such exalted language used by the psalmist to describe this king, as we'll see. And so, since we're not sure who wrote the psalm, nor are we sure who the king is in the psalm, I'm going to put forth a theory. And feel free to accept or reject. I will not take any offense whatsoever. But I believe that this psalm was written by David. I believe it was written by him for the temple choir, the future temple choir of the sons of Korah. And I believe that King David had one particular king in mind, one particular descendant of his in mind. It was that one who was promised in 1 Chronicles 17, the eternal king. The great king who was promised to him. I believe David wrote this psalm for the marriage day of this promised son. This greatest son who would descend from him. Not one who was promised would be the eternal king. We would see as we go how it is only Christ who can alone fulfill the words spoken about the king in this psalm. Why did David write this psalm? <clears throat> this gets us to the love song part David is keen to show the bride to give the bride a taste an inclination of the character and the superiority of her groom he is showing the bride who her groom is and what her groom has done and where her groom is now when we see the psalm as ultimately fulfilled in Christ, then we can appreciate the, the, these great words that come from Andrew Bonar. Whenever he said, in this psalm, it is earth taught by heaven to sing heaven's infinite love to man. The aim then, the reason of the song is to draw the heart of the bride out in love to her kingly groom. The psalmist informs the bride, yes, there's sacrifice involved here. There's sacrifice involved in this marriage. She must leave her father's house. She must forget her people. But with this sacrifice comes the greatest of gains. All of her sacrifice for this groom is worth it. What does she receive? This bride receives the groom's delight in her. She will be his joy. What a king to serve. What a husband to have. In the person of this bridegroom is a king worth loving. That's what love has got to do with this psalm. So this psalm is laid out in four parts. And so firstly, we see the psalmist's praises of the king. The psalmist's praises of the king in verses 1 and 2. This psalmist, as we have already noted, is a real artist with his language. His opening phrase could be translated, My heart is stewing, my heart is bubbling up and about to boil over with pleasant words. His mind and his heart are so filled with words that he can no longer hold his tongue. But what's the subject matter of his words, of his verses? It's about the king. But it's not only about the king, it's to the king. And he tells us of the character of this king. This king is fairer than the sons of man. This king has no equal amongst men. There's not another man upon the earth that is greater than this king in glorious appearance. And yet not only is his appearance dazzling, but the psalmist says that grace is poured upon his lips. Or it could also be translated, grace is poured out by his lips. Either way, grace is spoken by him. Grace finds its source in this king. And because of this, this king is blessed by God eternally. This this. this being blessed is not simply being blessed with good gifts. This is the blessing of praise and adulation. 
This king has been appointed by God as the eternal king and he receives the adulation of God. Everything that is pleasing to the eyes and to the ear is found in this glorified king. Can this king be any other than Christ Jesus? In Christ alone is found all the perfections that draw every sense to him in wonder and in awe. John the Apostle declared, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. Glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John was speaking in these words of the transfiguration of Jesus that he witnessed with Peter and James. Those three disciples were given a glimpse of the glory of Christ Jesus as he was transfigured before them with his, with his eternal glory on full blazing display. But in this glory, Jesus Christ was not displayed as a raging potentate, but he was displayed as one who was full of grace full of favor and full of compassion. And this grace marked all of his interactions with men and women, and with boys and girls. Luke tells us, and all spoke well of him and marveled at the gracious words that were coming from his mouth. Grace was upon the lips and was poured out by the lips of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> It's marvellous to think that David, or whoever the psalmist is, it's marvellous to think that he was enabled to, by the Holy Spirit, to look forward by faith in the promises that God had given to him and to his people. And by faith, see this great king. It was as this psalmist meditated on the words and promises of God concerning this Messiah, this king, that his heart bubbled up with these good words for and about this king. Brothers and sisters, we see this very same king. We have those same promises given to us in the Old Testament about this king and about his coming. But along with that, we have the accurate record of his life and death and his resurrection and ascension in the Gospels. And then on top of that, we have the writings of the apostles explaining to us the meaning of these facts, of the meaning of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. But when it comes to the eternal blessedness of Christ at this very moment, we exercise the same faith that the Old Testament saints exercised. Because Christ is in glory, and we are on earth. We cannot see him by sight. But by faith, we see him enthroned in heaven at God's right hand. But this, brothers and sisters, is not some blind faith. No, this is faith that has full sight. It is a faith grounded in the sure word of God. God has promised the coming of his Messiah for centuries and millennia to his saints in the Old Testament. And this God who sent that Messiah who revealed the Father to us in his life and his death and his resurrection. This same God confirms to us by his word that he has indeed blessed his Messiah. He has indeed set his king on his holy hill of Zion. And so, in the full assurance of faith in God's word and God's promise, we see this same king. As you see this king, as you read about him in this psalm and right throughout scripture, does your heart bubble up? Does your heart boil over with the good and the pleasing theme of this psalmist? Dear brothers and sisters, catch the wonder of these words. Don't let the wonder of King Jesus be lost upon you. Christ is presented here to your eye of faith through the, sh the sure and steadfast word of the promise of your heavenly father. 
like the psalmist, let your heart be captivated by him. With the psalmist, praise and magnify this king of glory. And then secondly, we see in verses 3 to 9, the victorious king, the victorious king. The psalmist goes on to show us the majesty of this king who is still future to him, whom he views with the eye of faith. And he, he sees a king who reigns. He sees a king who is eternally victorious in the cause of truth and right. This is a king who has done battle. This is a warrior king. He is mighty in battle. But he doesn't just wage war for the sake of it. He fights a just war. He battles, as the psalmist says, for the cause of truth and meekness and righteousness. And what does this phrase mean? It means that this king is not fighting for self-glory, but he's fighting for righteousness' sake. In his, in his war, he seeks not to glorify himself, but to glorify God and to reign for the good of his subjects. And he doesn't fail. His arrows are sharp. His arrows hit their target. His enemies fall under him. This king's kingdom does not totter. He's never on the verge of collapse. His throne is forever and ever. But in verse 6, look at how the psalmist addresses this king when he speaks to him. He says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. This king is called God. And this is where the writer of the Hebrews picks up on this in Hebrews 1 verses 8 and 9. Here we have in the Old Testament an indication that the Messiah whom God promised would himself be God. He would be God just like the one who sent him. But he would be a distinct person from the one who sent him. So only as we come into the New Testament that we see this more clearly than the Old Testament prophets saw it. In the New Testament, we see that the Father sent the Son in the power of the Holy Spirit. Three distinct persons. But the New Testament also maintains the vital point that these three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, are one God. One God in three persons. Yes, we see this more clearly than the Old Testament saints. But brothers and sisters, we're no closer to understanding it. The Trinity is a mystery for us not to solve. But the Trinity is a mystery for us to worship. What a marvelous thing it is that this King is God. This King sent by God. Blessed by God, equipped by God, is God himself. <clears throat> and as the victorious divine king, he will reign eternally. His kingship is marked by uprightness. In the, kingdom, in the kingdoms of men, uprightness, if it appears at all, it's a, it's, it's a mere policy of their reign. They can... Take it or leave it. It can appear and it may not appear. But in the reign of this great king, it's not a mere policy, but it is an attribute of his reign. There is no reign of God without righteousness. The reign of this king will never be anything but righteous. And because this king has loved righteousness and because he has hated wickedness, he has been anointed by God with the oil of gladness above his companions. This is a striking phrase. The psalmist says that this king has been anointed. That's where we get the word Messiah or the word Christ. It's as if the, the psalmist is saying this king has been messiah or he has been Christed. That's the force of the word that is translated anointed. And Peter brings this out on the day of Pentecost when he says, Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord 
and Christ, both Lord and anointed one, this Jesus whom you crucified. Because of who Jesus is as the God man, and because of what he has done, because he loved righteousness, and because he hated wickedness, then he laid down his life. And he laid down his life, crushing the head of the serpent. This was his battle. This was his war. And because he has done that, God has declared him to be the Messiah whom he has promised. God has shown that Jesus Christ is the anointed one, promised from the foundation of the world. But look what he is anointed with. He's not only anointed, but he is anointed with <clears throat> the oil of gladness. This gladness, it's not any ordinary happiness. It's not your run-of-the-mill joy, if there's such a thing. But it is a joy that flows <clears throat> from being in a covenant relationship with God. Only those who have a covenant relationship with God enjoy this type of gladness. But this king, he experiences this gladness to the nth degree. No one was ever anointed with such gladness as this king has been. Who is the happiest man alive today? The happiest man alive today is not on earth. The happiest man alive today is in heaven. And he is our king. He is our saviour. What does the writer to the Hebrews say about Jesus and joy? He says in Hebrews 12 verse 2, Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. What drove Jesus on in his battle against his enemies? What drove Jesus on in that war which he waged against Satan? What drove Jesus on as he crushed the serpent's head, even at the cost of bruising his own heel? It was joy. It was the prospect of this gladness which he was to be anointed with. Jesus knew that ahead of him was the anointing of gladness above his fellows. He knew that the joy of fulfilling that covenant of grace, which we heard about this morning, uh, when we read the Shorter Catechism together, he knew that the fulfilling of this covenant would bring him joy. The psalmist lists for us these joys in verses 8 to 9 in what would seem to be ascending value. Almost like the steps ascending to the throne. The king's robes were fragranced with the sweetest of aromas. The king's ears are graced with the finest of music, coming from the most opulent of places. Even his very maidservants are royalty. But what is the pinnacle of his joy? What is it that makes all of these other things pale in their, in their significance? It is his bride. It is his queen who stands at his right hand in the gold of Ophir. She is at the top of that ascent to the throne. It is this bride for whom he has battled. He has won her by the sacrifice of himself. She is the joy that was set before him. Dear believer, do you realize that you are the source of Christ's joy? Think about it. The very thought of you thrills Jesus Christ. When the writer to the Hebrews speaks of the joy that was set before Christ, he is speaking about you. Christ endured the cross for the joy of having you as part of his bride, as part of his church. He loved you and he gave himself for you. 
we can get so used to the facts of the gospel. <clears throat> we can become so blasé and we can, can become so unmoved by the fact that Jesus Christ died for us because the prospect of having us as his bride brought him joy. What a king. Behold, brothers and sisters, how much he loves you. So the psalmist has spoken to the king. He has spoken about the king. But now the psalmist turns to the bride and addresses her directly. And so thirdly, we see the glorious bride. The glorious bride in verses 10 to 15. psalmist <clears throat> exhorts the bride in verse 10 to throw in her lot with this king completely and he recognizes that the bride could be torn she could feel the draw of the old familiar home she could feel the draw of her own family and her own people and she might desire the comfort of the familiar over the love of her king over the love of her groom but the psalmist exhorts her to forget her old life. Her, her new life as the queen must now be the, the only life that she thinks about. But the psalmist isn't calling her to a life uh, of the stiff upper lip, facing her royal duties regardless of the coldness of royal life. No, this is going to be a warm family, a warm marriage to enter into in return for wholehearted devotion to her groom the queen is assured of his fervent love and devotion the king seeks only to lavish his affection and his love upon his bride the king will desire her beauty this is so applicable to us in our day as the bride of christ the church is under immense pressure to be anything but fully devoted to her king to her bridegroom. From so, many from so many corners, the church has been drawn away from unreserved allegiance to her Savior. For so many believers, there's the, the threat of persecution and the threat even of death. For us, though, that's not so much our experience. <clears throat> but we are being no less drawn away from Christ through other means. Christianity in our nation, in our generation, it's becoming what you could call a social nuisance. You Christians and your regulations that you want to put, that you want to place upon everyone else. Hasn't society had enough of you? Hasn't society have, had enough of your shackles for centuries? Leave us alone. We want to live our own lives. Brothers and sisters, we're being viewed as obstacles on the road of progress Christianity has also been viewed as a harmful delusion there was a time when even atheists viewed Christianity as helpful in society even if it was delusional but that's no longer the case there are many who see Christianity as intellectually damaging and then there are those for whom Christianity is a barrier to prosperity what do you mean? Stop working for one day and one whole day in the week? Are you mad? Look at all of the money that I could make in that one day. And all of these things, brothers and sisters, are being pushed upon us. There is so much in this society that seeks to draw us away from Christ. But look at what the psalmist says in verse 11. He says, since he is your Lord bow to him he is your lord he is the only one who is worthy of your wholehearted devotion and love and service with so much aimed at distracting you from christ cling to him don't let anything in this life loosen your grip of jesus christ but not only does the king seek his bride's unreserved de devotion but the nations of the earth seek her favor. This king is so exalted that the people of Tyre, the gold and the silver barons of the ancient Near East, they come bowing and scraping to her. 
showering her with gifts, simply to gain an audience with her. When we were in France recently, we visited the, the, the town of Saint-Tropez. And if you want to go somewhere to gaze at people who are minted, dripping with wealth, then that's the place to go. But in our experience, and I'm sure it's the experience of everyone else, it's a one-way gaze. Those who are dripping with wealth, they're not looking back at us. We, the ordinary people, we're not even worth a first glance, let alone a second glance. Imagine our amazement if, if one of these super wealthy people were to bow face down to the ground and hand us Rolex watches and the, the keys to their massive yachts, if we would simply acknowledge their existence. That's the scenario pictured in this psalm as the people of Tyre, the wealthiest people on the face of the earth, approach this bride with gifts. But this only happens on account of her husband. This is what Andrew Bonner calls the splendor of dominion possessed by the bride through the right of the bridegroom. Dear Bride of Christ, yes, we are despised by the world. We are hated for the sake of Christ Jesus. But praise God, down through history, there have been those mighty ones. There have been those wealthy and rich ones who have acknowledged the supremacy of Christ and have acknowledged the privileged place and position that he has given to his bride. There have been kings and queens, prime ministers and presidents down through the centuries who have bowed to Christ Jesus. This promise given to the bride in this psalm gives us confidence to pray that more rulers would do the same. And the psalmist then describes the bride. She is said to be all glorious. All glorious. There is no defect in her. She is as radiant within as she is dazzling without. And she is brought with rejoicing into the presence of her groom. And Jude, in, at the end of his epistle, he echoes this when he says, Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. It is through the person and the work of our King that the church is pure and spotless and is brought before her King in great joy. Dear believer, are you perhaps afraid to meet your King? Do you think of that day with a certain degree of trepidation? Brothers and sisters, when you are brought before the king, there will be joy. Not only your joy, but his joy. Because he will see you as all glorious. You will be all glorious because you are in him. Because you are in him who is the Lord, our righteousness. Fourthly and finally. The psalmist's promises to the king, verses 16 and 17. In, the, in these verses, the psalmist now turns back to address the king. The words you and your, uh, the, in Hebrew, where we know that these are spoken to a man, as though they're spoken to the king. And the, the psalmist says, in place of your fathers shall be your sons. In the days of the psalmist, the sons were regarded as inferior to their fathers. But the psalmist promises the king that his sons would be greater than his fathers. How could that be? Only because this king would be the king of God's kingdom that has finally been universally and eternally established. You see, no king from David's line could ever say all power and all authority has been given unto me. That is until Christ. 
Only when Christ came. Only when he completed that war. Only when he was glorified. Could, uh, could any king from David's line say all power and all authority has been given unto me? But not only that, what does Christ promise his people? That they will reign for him, with him forever and ever. Every believer is promised a kingdom greater than anything ever ruled by David's mortal sons. And then to crown it out, the prospects, to crown out the prospects for this king, in verse 17, he is given a name that will never be forgotten. And not only will his name be remembered, but it will be the praise of the nations. These promises amount to an eternal, an unending kingdom that will be to the praise of the glory of the grace of the triune God in Jesus Christ, the King of kings and Lord of lords. But notice one thing at the start of verse 17. The psalmist says, I will cause your name to be remembered. I will cause your name to be remembered. Who is the one doing the causing here? Regardless of who the psalmist is, the ultimate writer of the psalm is the Holy Spirit. And the writer to the Hebrews picks up this when he says, God said of his son. And then he refers to this psalm. God is the one who is speaking here. It is the Holy Spirit who is spreading the fame of Jesus across the face of the earth. It is the Holy Spirit who is, who is drawing people to this victorious king, into his church, into that glorious bride for whom Christ has died. And as a result of the work of the Holy Spirit, the king's name will be praised forever and ever from every nation on the face of the earth. Brothers and sisters, the psalmist has sought to draw your heart out after Christ in loving devotion. How often our hearts are inclined to be cold towards Christ. How seldom do our hearts bubble up and overflow in love to him. What's the remedy? How do we go about fixing that? The remedy is to go to the word. The remedy is to let the word of Christ Spoken by his spirit, let it sink into your heart and relish everything that the Holy Spirit tells you about Christ as you read about him. And as the spirit drives home the truths about him, as the spirit opens your eyes to the love of God in Christ Jesus for you, Christ will become to you fairer than all of the sons of men. You will see that indeed Christ is a king worth loving. He is a king worth serving. As we close, let me ask you, has this king captured your heart? Do you love this king? Look what he has done for his bride. He loved her and gave himself for her. See the devotion that the bride is called to give to the king. See what the Holy Spirit is doing for the, for the glory of this king. John closes out the book of Revelation with these words. The spirit and the bride say, come. Heed the voice of the bride. Heed the call of the Holy Spirit. Come to Christ. Bow to him in humble love and devotion. Rest in his finished work. Trust in the victory that this king has accomplished on Calvary's cross. Amen.